Happy almost signing day, everyone. Or if you're listening to this on Wednesday, hey, happy signing day. We got the one, the only John Garcia of Sports Illustrated here to break everything down with Michigan State signing day. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Our Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, hello, and welcome to Signing Day. Yes, we have John Garcia, the recruiting director of Sports Illustrated here. But first, before I let this gentleman talk, I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football and college basketball recruiting sponsor across the Lockdown Network. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash Lockdown College. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, just a recruiting director talking to us uh, ahead of signing day here. How are you alive? How, how are you doing? Like, how are you doing, John? I that's am in fact question. alive. We, okay, we are good. here, yeah. live in the flesh. Uh, <laughs> it's good, amazing, amazing uh, signing day stretch. Just the drama, the coaching changes, the portal, the sure. flips. I mean, it has been yeah. uh, fast and furious for sure. No doubt about that. And I, look, even just from a micro standpoint, just with Michigan State, a lot going on here. This is a polarizing topic amongst the fan base. There is a good contingent that's saying, hey, off a of five and seven season, okay, we have eight or nine four stars, depending on what site you look at. It's actually going pretty okay, all things considered. And then there's the other end of the spectrum that's being like, what are you idiots talking about? We have 13 <laughs> kids in this class, a lot of decommits. This is not going well whatsoever. So, John, as the rational mind that you are, can you please just help us form an opinion how we should be feeling about Michigan State on signing day right now? It's probably a bit of both. I think that if you're okay. getting both sides consistently, I think yes. this thing has shifted quite a bit. Um, Michigan State has flipped recruits and have been poached at the same time. Yep. Um, the portal's still there. We know that's going to be a big part of, of every recruiting cycle. Um, but, look, you're still – at that same time, you're still holding on to SI 99 recruits, like by Joe. You've got your yep. quarterback after, let's be honest, after taking a big risk, right? Dropping Bo yeah. Edmonton, going for Dante Moore, missing there. To find a legitimate quarterback in Sam Levitt, I thought was a huge and important win for MSU. You've got great players coming in the trenches. So you've got a strong foundation not the volume that you want uh, on top of it. But again, the portal is going to be a supplement uh, as well. And and there's still a lot TBD, right? You've got the early signing period. Uh, and then you're going to have the traditional period, the portal, all opening and, and remaining fluid at the same time. So I do think this is going to be, for every coaching staff, this is going to be one of those opportunities to make moves quickly once that signing day dust settles on Friday. Uh, not just Wednesday, but on Friday yeah. when the period closes. And you regroup and say, okay, this is where we're at. Oh, okay, we've got two extra scholarships. Guess what? Two more potential portal additions or whatever that's going to be. So Mel Tucker's been through this before. Um, You know, it's roster construction. It's rough. Everyone's dealing with it. Um, I saw Ole Miss just lost their quarterback commitment last night before we recorded this, and they're they're stuck. There's no other quarterback there. So it it is it's rough for even programs that are finishing on a high note and in big time bowl games uh, not just the 5 and 7 folks uh like Michigan State uh, so I, I do think this is a universal conversation and everyone's dealing with something similar kind of a, a bit of an up and down uh, unless your name is you know Georgia or or Texas or or Alabama or, sure. or, or something like that yeah yeah of course of course yeah. any flip candidates on, on signing day that us fans should be excited about or worried about i'm talking like flipping to michigan state or away from <laughs> michigan state because from what i know it, it doesn't seem like a lot of drama will be had but obviously you're the insider so we're gonna ask you this question yeah i think levitt was the last big one obviously riscano was was up in the yep. air till just the other day um but landing the, the couple of california guys over the last few days was big i think those guys were on the board uh, I'm curious about, uh, of course, you know, does by Job take a look? I, I know folks are still calling there. That could yep. be a, a bit of a worry point, but I do expect him at this point to stick uh, with MSU. What about David Hicks? How does that look on National Signing Day? You're certainly, 
you got a puncher's chance there. Uh, so you, you'll still send an NLI for sure. Um, yeah. And then I'm curious about Joe Crocker. He just decommitted from Mississippi State. At one point we thought he was a bit of an MSU lean or the northern MSU sure. lean. Right. Obviously circumstances pretty crazy uh, around Mississippi State following uh, the death of Mike Leach. So you don't know how timeline-wise – that could potentially uh, affect things. But as of right now, I think it's going to be steady for Michigan State going in and out uh, of this signing period, barring a, a kid or two. But as long as, again, that core of the class, Levitt is done uh, after overtures from some other programs, the trenches look solid, and, and you kind of build from there depending on how the dust settles. And just to spike our anxiety a little higher, by Job, like on the off chance that it doesn't work out for Michigan State, what other schools are – mostly in his ear besides the Spartans. Well, we know Oklahoma held a bunch of buzz before, you know, he made that mm-hmm. verbal commitment. Obviously, he's he's from the state of yep. not only the state of Oklahoma, he's from Norman. Uh so that oh, was always okay. <laughs> going to be something and Oklahoma since the season ended has really doubled down on defensive recruiting and they've upticked for a lot of recruits. They're still in the David Hicks sweepstakes as well. Uh so I do think there's there's something to worry about and, and at least be curious about their between Brent Venables and Todd Bates, the D-line coach, a couple of good recruiters uh, that, that have had more time uh, to get in with some of these prospects. But again, I haven't heard anything tangible to say sound the alarm for by Joe, but keep an eye on when his letter is supposed to be signed. Sure. Uh, re- refresh that uh, Michigan State football account and make sure uh, it, it comes in for sure. Yeah, uh, no doubt about that. I do that every single year. Uh, just hit, hit, hit refresh. So, yeah. Um, yeah. About that, though, it, it, there's another name that's out there. It's Keyshawn Blackstock. He's the junior college uh, out of Coffeyville in Georgia. Michigan State's a hot name for him. Do you know much about his situation at all and if he's leaning one way or another at this point in time? Which I should tell people right now as we are recording, noon on Tuesday, in the world of signing day, a lot can change within the minutes. But sure. as of now, anything leaning with him? Yeah, look, he really liked that Michigan State visit. Um, I was curious to see if he was going to wait and maybe sign in February because he did have a few more officials open. But he yeah. actually told me this morning, thanks to you for prepping me with this, he told me this morning he will sign this week. Uh, okay. He's got a top five out there. I know USC just offered him. They look like they're doubling down in the trenches. So could it be a situation where a school like that pulls a kid without a visit? I mean, it's not unprecedented. Uh, right. But at this point, you, you feel better about, uh, you know, places that have hosted him. And, and certainly Penn State getting their visit canceled, Michigan State getting their visit granted, and him enjoying it is something that is is probably going to work out. We know with Portal and junior college players in particular, there's a little bit more, to me, a little bit more benefit of the doubt uh, with, with Sparty and, and how they view Mel Tucker and Michigan State's program. So I, I think the pedigree of, of success in pulling from those ranks in particular could definitely help uh, with Keyshawn. No doubt. And hey, a kid can, uh, especially an offensive lineman, can commit somewhere without ever taking a visit. We know that with Peyton Kirkland. So head down to Texas. <laughs> yes. Never visited there. Great times. This has just been an awesome uh, whirlwind of a recruiting cycle. No doubt about that. I want to talk to you about, you know, your gems for this Michigan State class. Of course, you know, by Job, he's going to be cream of the crop. But I want to pick your brain about who else you're liking from this class. But that's going to be what we call a tease here in the Ooh. podcast world because I got to talk everyone's ear off about betonline.net first. That's right, gang. Hey, it is still quite the season. Yes, World Cup fever is over, but hey, we still got bowl games. Okay, we still got NBA basketball, college hoops. If you want to wager a few shekels on Spartans versus Golden Grizzlies Wednesday night, we'll do so at Bet Online. They are your number one source for your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from pro football to college bowl season to basketball. Hey, they got esports as well. They've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, which I'm going to fetch a guess that you kind of care for them if you're listening to this right now. Well, I got good news for you, Buckaroo. You can find even more of those at Bet Online as well. We are the fastest and easiest way to get in on all of the sports betting action. So, what are you waiting for? Head to the website today, use your mobile device, learn more about the trends and action that is at Bet Online where the game starts. And let's get John Garcia Jr. of Sports Illustrated back into the fold here. There's not a lot of names to pick from. There's 13 names to pick from for, for, for these gems. Uh, but if you can narrow it down to like one or two sneaky guys that are maybe underappreciated with this class, 
Who are you going to go with for our Spartans here, John? I, I love Jalen Thompson. I know he's probably not as underappreciated locally because he's a Cast Tech kid, but mm-hmm. when you look at him compared to a by Job in, in particular, similar size, similar explosiveness. If anything, Thompson, from a height, weight, and length standpoint, a little bit more ready to see the field physically. Okay then by Job at the same stage. So I think he's a step ahead from a physical department, maybe higher floor, lower ceiling compared to by, but you pair those together and you start to talk about some potentially special things uh, going down. Uh, obviously, um, I-, I love the floor of Jordan Hall. I, I think he's ready-made today to come in and compete, uh, especially given his last couple of years at IMG as, as really the anchor and leader of that linebacker core Levitt deserves some flowers here too. I'm sure we'll talk about him here in a minute, but the jump from junior year to senior year was, was really notable. Uh, He dominated competition as a, as a really kind of sneaky dual threat. Uh, There's, there's a lot of athletic prowess with him, strong and developed lower half uh, of his frame. And it really helps him both as a passer and a runner. Think of like a bigger Baker Mayfield in terms of how he's put together, and there's, there's some of that in there with Levitt. Uh, so he's earned this uptick in, in recruiting attention, of course, was looking at Washington, Washington State, mm-hmm. and, and Sparty, among others. Uh, so I like I like those gets as well. But again, I, I just really like what Michigan State was aiming to do in this class, and it was really built from the inside out. I love the Dellinger-Ramil combo at potential tackle on the offensive line and obviously Job and Thompson on the defensive line. And, and look um, – Mr. Mr. West Coast, uh, Jalen Barberin, look, yeah. this is this is different, right? When you talk about uh, taking advantage of that that Big Ten move uh, for, for USC and UCLA and, and recruiting California a little bit more, it's with guys like this in mind, right? 5'9", 185, 10-4 in the 100-meter dash. Yeah. Give them the ball a couple times a game and let them cook, right? I mean, watch the NFL, how many guys under six feet that can really, really run – are making plays uh, all over the place. I just watched the Rams game Monday night. Tutu Atwell is like five, six, 150 pounds right. making play <laughs> in the NFL because he's got that one trick that you can't teach. And I think Jalen's got a little bit more wiggle and balance to his game than he's given credit for, even though he's profiled as, as such a speedster. So I liked, I liked MSU going out to Cali and, and grabbing those uh, close friends and, and former teammates. And I want to stick with Barber in here right now because, look, everything that you said is amazing, especially that speed. I mean, there's some people that are saying that he's the fastest kid in this class. Could but be. yet you look at a lot of rankings and he's outside the top 800, the top 900 or whatever. So, like, what is missing from his game that's, you know, keeping him from being this great, incredible <laughs> rated recruit? Two, two things here. One, when, when you are so dominant in one sport that it becomes viewed as your primary sport, the secondary sport and the perception around it will suffer. So if you're viewed first as a track okay. guy and then, oh, what about football? I think that hurts you perceptionally. And I think for him, he also went through in football specifically a bit of a position change a year ago. Yeah. The industry thought he was a receiver, slot, return man, kind of the conventional small, fast guy. And then as a senior, all of a sudden lines up at running back, and you're like, oh, no, he's a running back. This this is where he is much more natural. So now you're you're almost docking him for his versatility and ability to do more than one thing. Uh, But what I like about those type of players is that they're impressive when they're not able to focus on one thing. So imagine – when they are able to focus on that one thing. So I think he was easy, kind of low-hanging fruit to 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 knock a little bit, to, to peg down just a bit compared to some others. Um, but I think it's one of those when you look back on the class, you're like, oh, this was this was kind of a mistake. <laughs> Reminds me a bit of Rayshon Luke, who was a late ad for Arizona last year, blew up at the Army All-American Bowl, and then as a freshman got a bunch of run for the Wildcats and had some big plays against Utah, you know? So, I mean, that's a a nice late grab that will look better as time goes on, in my opinion. Gotcha. And to jump back to conversation topics, you know, the quarterback room, Sam Levitt uh, enters, but Hey, uh, Oregon just lost their quarterback commit. I don't know if anyone on the show has ever heard the kid's name. His name is Dante Moore. Never talked about him on this show. Uh, Of course not, but he goes to UCLA and uh uh-oh, Oregon doesn't have a quarterback and double uh uh-oh, 
Mr. Levin is from Oregon. Are the Ducks a threat at all to this commitment, in your opinion, or do you think it's as close to a done deal as it could be a day ahead of signing day for us? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's done. Uh, this okay. is great timing for MSU to have completed this flip yeah. before Dante yeah. made his decision, especially considering – that you know, Oregon, Oregon also changed offensive coordinators, right? So the timing yep. of everything really benefited Michigan State here. So I, I do think if if the new OC was local, a Pacific Northwest type of guy, maybe even a California guy, I think that could have made some sense. And, and hey, you make at least a phone call. Uh, but they brought in Will Stein from Texas, and their top target is from Texas, Austin Novosad, the Baylor commitment. So maybe a flip happens for Oregon. I just don't expect it to be this shade of green i expect it to be uh green and yellow uh from, from, from waco texas although i actually kind of think the nova side kid sticks with with baylor in the end because i don't think he got up for a visit there is some talk he might have okay. but there's no talk that levitt took that trip to, to eugene uh, even though at that point oregon was kind of aware that the dante smoke was was legitimate to ucla interesting gotcha and you know just to flip sides of the field right here and we'll speaking of flips there's twin brothers down in Florida, four-star linebackers. Michigan State, of course, lost Javon Brown, four-star linebacker. Uh, and a lot of fans are still thinking that, well, maybe that, hey, they do commit to Michigan State. They were in the final three at the very end. Yep. We hypothesized that, no, it could probably be Arkansas because, well, the UCF defensive coordinator is going over to Arkansas. It is, are the Spartans a factor at all, in your opinion, for Andrew and Michael Harris, or is that ship sailed completely over the horizon? They're in it. You know, I was actually connected with some UCF sources today on, on this front. You know, they're local kids to UCF, and they feel like they're out of it. They they do feel like okay. the Big Ten schools are very much in it. Michigan State and Maryland. Maryland's kind of the sneaky program yep. in this race for both of them. You know, obviously they've recruited incredibly well on the East Coast. Uh, so I, I think that could be where they end up, but there is not 100% certainty there. So I, I think it's a Michigan State – Maryland battle. I don't think T. Will is going to be able to port them over from mm -hmm. UCF uh, at his new post in Arkansas. Just, just not enough time. No visit out that way. Okay. These are Orlando kids. You know, it's just a, a bit of a contrast or a bit more of a contrast to, to go out to Fayetteville. So I do think it's a Big Ten type of deal, but I actually think Maryland is the primary competition, not Arkansas. Interesting. Okay. Well, glad to ask you because I've been singing the wrong tune. I heard for a lot of people like, oh yeah, no, it's hundred percent Arkansas. They've already moved into their dorms essentially down there. <laughs> it, but, look, it's moving fast. No, it's, of course, an excellent yeah. recruiter. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think I think this has a little bit more Big Ten smoke than uh, SEC. One um quick one here, and I'm sorry, I didn't put this down in our notes, so you can pass the buck here from catching you completely off guard with this one. But this is another name that's really hot in the fan base. It's a transfer from Kentucky, five star offensive tackle, Keontae Goodwin. Any read on where he's going to go, Spartans a factor at all? Because we've been hearing complete mixed messages from insiders within the program, outside the program, like, oh, yeah, no, Michigan State's in his living room right now. We're like, <laughs> no, they haven't actually even contacted him. Uh, it's 100% it's Louisville for this kid. So do you have a read on Goodwin at all? Well, look, when, when you're from that part of, of Kentucky, you know, that that's always kind of the natural pivot there. And, yeah. and, and Louisville's going to be – a little bit more offensively, you know, friendly, right? Under Brom coming back home, you understand some of the momentum that that the Cardinals have. But go back to his recruitment, and yeah, yeah. MSU was in there. It was it was a huge, big kind of national battle there. So you could understand if MSU jumped back in. But a lot of these kids are making decisions quickly, you know. So I think uh, the the visit cycle and it being dead in terms of a dead period is is really hard to gauge any different feels in the portal although we talked about high school players hey if you don't take a visit tough to go there doesn't exist in the portal mm -hmm. you can make a decision absolutely without having made a trip up to east lansing or wherever you, you may be considering so don't rule it out we know it's a big need uh, for msu and uh, i think physically he's one of the biggest uh, prospects available yeah. but there's a there's a lot of great linemen available and we know the portal is going to be quite friendly uh, to the spartans they've already hit what three or four guys, uh, mostly skill guys. So you know, the the trench guys are are going to come yep. on the back end for sure. No doubt. And yeah, as we wind down this interview, just got a few more questions for you. Um, I, I have to remind myself sometimes this too that it is early signing day. Like th th yes. there's there's two windows here. Like this this is early signing day. This is a little tease for you. But what what percentage of kids? I mean, obviously there's thousands of kids, but like legitimately ranked kids 
sign on early signing day. So it was like, I guess a better way to ask this. Is signing day essentially 80% over after Wednesday, 90% over, just 50? Like, what, what do you get it's, out of this? It's closer to 75, 80. Um, Got it, okay. With, with the recent history, that that's what the precedent tells us. And I do think there's a little bit, I would say, even more emphasis for these kids to sign now because – these portal spots are getting cleaned up fast. And, you know, mm-hmm. every coach is complaining about how the portal is affecting high school recruiting um, yeah. and, and how quickly it's affecting high school recruiting. Uh, so so there is an urgency from from these kids uh, and these colleges. Say, hey, you take this spot now. Your, your letter is going to be here December 21st. It might not be there on February 1st. Uh, that's how quickly things can change. And we also know a lot of these coaching staffs – ethically or not, are going to dump some coaches after signing day, right? So the board totally shifts beyond that early signing period, unless you are the elite of the elite, like a Nicholas Harbor, who we know is going to decide in February. His his situation won't change much, but for just about everyone else, it will. So the number is 75, 80%, but we could see a little spike this year because of so much activity in the transfer portal. And a lot of these kids in the portal have having already made decisions. Gotcha. And, and before I, you know, let you walk out the door here and, you know, just enjoy the rest of your day, r- relax the rest of your Tuesday. I'm sure you <laughs> yeah, got nothing else sure. going on. Uh, this is a question you're either going to love or you're going to hate. And you don't have to name a school. You don't have to name a player. But like with NIL, everything going on, you're obviously in the weeds. What's the highest like dollar amount that you've heard for a kid? <sighs> Uh, either you're going to love this or hate this one. And if your internet <laughs> mysteriously cuts out, I, I completely understand. But like, I've, I've heard, I've heard deals that were negotiated initially for one year and then have been countered with like a package, like, Hey, okay. over three years, this is the number I've, I've heard three years, $10 million. Uh, it's, oh. <laughs> you know what position it is. It, oh it, man, the numbers Buzz are only going yep. up. Yeah, the, the numbers are only going up. It, it is really wild. It's not, it's not as common as it's being portrayed to be. But okay, with the quarterbacks and with the high end ones, it is yeah. astronomical. Um, there's there's a lot there's a lot to sort out uh, in college football <sighs> recruiting. Um, but look, it, it's legal. It's, it's name legal, of the game. and it's just a promise. It's not a contract being signed until you theoretically get there. So, yeah, I don't know what the fix is, but the dollar amounts are not going to go down. They're only going to go up from here. So I heard a wow. joke today from an SEC staffer that says, I wonder when school X, and you can look at the rankings and, and the uh-huh. on-field record and kind of decipher who it might be. I wonder when school X is going to offer a three-star $15 million a year. That was the joke. But it's not that high, but you know it's high, even for yeah. some of those guys that aren't as, as highly thought of. So it is – it's quite the story. It's not going away, and those dollar amounts wow. aren't going down, that's for sure. Wow. So MSU offered Sam Levitt three years $10 million. I can't believe it. Wow, that's, that's unbelievable. You said that. You said yeah, can't, that. can't believe it. <laughs> un, un, quite literally unbelievable because it's not real. I just made that part up of that. Well, John, this has been awesome. Uh, everyone watching, listening, of course, we're going to be back tomorrow. We're going to recap everything that happened on signing day. Pray to God that by Job signs with Michigan State. And also, hey, uh, also cherry on top, Oakland University versus Michigan State basketball. We will recap that as well. John, good luck the next 24, 48, 72 hours, however long this is going to drag on for you. You are the man. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time here. Really, really appreciate talking to you as always. Anytime. You got it. All right, gang. Hey, we'll see you tomorrow. Let's have a great signing day. Love you all. Go Green.